today is Friday. Friday, June 24th, 2022, a day that will live in infamy. Maybe, maybe, we'll see. It's also Kaumba, which is creativity because it's everyday Kwanzaa, everyday Black history, everyday women's history, everyday us on the Karen Hunt Show. And it's also Foolishness Friday, and we have a lot of foolishness to gather and get to. I cannot wait. But first, let me say thank you to the team and hello, Smizzy. Yeah! What's up, Alexa? How you doing? <laughs> Amina. Hello! Tramel. Wow! Truth in the universe. Hi. The Andy, right. be of Malcolm X. Andy, Maddie, Queen Lindsay, the video team. Madonna and Advisor. And family. Hey, yeah. 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 All right. Hey, hey, all of y'all, listen, listen. Before I introduce my first guest, um, some things happened today, but I don't know what the shock and awe is about. We've known for weeks, they already floated it out that this was happening. Why are you shocked? I put, I'm so surprised. And then people said, why are you surprised? I'm like, it's called sarcasm. I guess it does not resonate on the Twitters, which is why we have created a whole other space where we can have irony, but where we have building. But before we get to that, because I want to, I want to, I want to make an appeal today. Anybody who is outraged and upset and angry, and you don't know what to do, and you're mad, and you're like, I want to do something. We have a place for you to come. But I want to play this clip first. December 10th, December 10th, 2015, I'd been on the air about a year and change, and I started watching because you don't, let me just play the clip and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pat myself on the back. I'm gonna do that, but let me play the clip first before I start telling you how great I am. This play, tw- hold on, Smith, let me, no, hold on, stop it. December 10th, 2015, play it. This 2016 election is not about president. It's not about who's going to be president. It's about who's going to be president to pick the next Supreme Court justices. Because I guarantee you that if we have a person from the GOP sitting in that White House and we have at least two, which we will over the next four years, justices up for grabs, possibly three, they're more likely to put a Scalia on the court than they will a Sotomayor. They're more likely to put a Scalia or a Thomas on the court than they will a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, rock star that she is, how long can she live? The woman's battled every kind of cancer imaginable. She's damn near 90 and she's holding on. Damn it, don't let her go out with somebody sitting in her seat like we had to watch Clarence Thomas fill Thurgood Marshall's seat. That's an abomination, the highest order. Scalia was still alive. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still alive and Trump was not the nominee on December 10th, 2015. I'm not a political analyst, nor am I a prophet. So let me just say that I'm somebody who pays attention, who cares deeply, who's lived her entire life fighting and also strategizing. Because when you're built a certain kind of way, you're going to have to navigate spaces in a way differently. I couldn't skin and grin. I couldn't shuck and jive. White people were never going to be comfortable with me. People in power were never going to be comfortable with me. So I had to always figure out how to navigate power as a little girl. And I've never been a little girl, by the way. I was 5'10", two uh, two plus size 12 shoe in the sixth grade. So that said, (laughs) that said, you just sit and you watch and you say, how do we win? And my solution was in... 2015, and I kept beating the drum. We came up with the party of Lincoln because I said, oh, Trump can win. Y'all were like, no, he can't. I was like, I was at the Daily News when he put out a full page ad calling for the killing of the what they call the Central Park Five. And they were convicted primarily because of his widespread spread campaign to put those boys away. Who did not do it, by the way. They're now the exonerated five. I watched him work. He's a carnival barker. He is a marketing genius, one would say. I knew he could win. So I said, how do we stop him from winning? Party of Lincoln registers Republican in these particular states where there's closed primaries and primary his ass. Vote for Jeb Bush. Why? Because Jeb Bush can't beat Hillary Clinton. That's what I said. Then he dropped out. All right. Vote for Kasich. He can't beat Hillary Clinton. Vote for Kasich. 
I'm not registered as a Republican. I can't. Be, blah, 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 blah. And you know what happened? A million people. Oh, I'm sorry. A hundred million people failed to vote in 2016. A hundred million people sat home on 2016 and we got Trump. And you know what he did? He didn't put one. He got Obama's pick with, you know, was supposed to be Merrick Garland, which we now know might have been a disaster. But he put Gorsuch on and then that was Scalia's seat. And then Ruth Bader Ginsburg gave up the ghost because... December 10th, 2015, how long could she last? How long could she last? And then we got the Handmaid's Tale. Mm. Three mother freaking picks. I predicted it. It happened, but I'm not a prophet. All you need to do is sit and watch. So let me welcome to the show. <sighs> this man is the reason why there's a Nubia. You know that that's true. Uh, no, it's, no, no, no. This is why. Because here, just like in 2015, Dr. Carter, I'm going to introduce you properly. Mm -hmm. Let me do that. We sat every Saturday. It's now going to be 120 uh, wow. Saturdays, 120 Saturdays in a row during yeah. a pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in those conversations, I said, why don't we know this? Why don't we know this? Why don't we know this? Why don't we? And then, OK, how do we help people to know things? So it started with that. And then it became, well, what if we had a community where we could actually build and grow and make things make things happen? Why are we sitting on the sidelines, bitching and complaining? Let's get some stuff done. Yes. And then less than a year ago, nine months, Nubia was born. Yes. So let me welcome to the show um, in class with Carr, Africana Studies. He also has a law degree, which is why it's so super important. But it's through this lens that we need to understand what is happening. Let me welcome the great Dr. Greg Carr. Hi. Professor Hunter. Oh, I love it. I'm so glad to see you. I love you. And you, yeah, we, we've been having these conversations now for two years. We haven't missed a Saturday and we haven't repeated ourselves. And you said, you know what? We need to create a space where we can have conversation build. And so I want to thank you for, in fact, the new normal. New, mm -hmm. new normal. It is the new normal. I mean, oh, I, I, should I'm be. so free. <laughs> that's that's to you. Thank you, sis. On behalf well, of look, all of us in the growing Nubian nation. Well, I want to thank the ancestors. Um, we have been sitting for the last four plus weeks with Octavia Butler, who also was not a prophet when she wrote in 1990s, uh, what we call Earthseed, Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talent, in which she uh, identified a president named Donner. That's right. Named Donner who uh, whose slogan was make America great again. That's right. And again, it doesn't take all day to recognize what is happening. You just have to pay attention. But what I want to say, those of you who are inclined to do something and you live someplace and you want to see something different, come join us in Nubia. Yeah. We're going to tweet out the link. You got to go through narrative because it's not about being in Nubia. It's about being in narrative. Nubia is the extras, the cherry on the top, but it is everything. Right. Because if you live somewhere and you want to organize, Eldroy Williams is in Nubia. Lurie Daniel Favors is in Nubia. Come you want to organize in your particular state? We got master organizers and political strategists in Nubia. And if you are a political strategist, come over to Nubia. You live someplace. If you live in Texas, if you live in Florida, if you live in Alabama, if you live in, in, in Louisiana, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Come in and build. That's right. Because what we see, Dr. Carr, is, you know, I said it was 40 years that they've been planning to overturn Ro Roe v. Wade. You said 17 what was it 1789? <laughs> They've been planning when they, when they passed the federal constitution. I mean, this is this is a war, and and, and as, as you said, that's right. Narrative the K is silent, but as Black Thought said, it's imperative that we change the narrative. So <laughs> you got to come to narrative, and there's as much work there as you can stand. Organizing, thinking, working through, uh, bringing your skills. If you say, "Well, I don't have any skills," bring yourself. Don't worry. We get you got the skill of being you, and I love those three elements that you laid out at the very beginning number one pay attention pay attention that's how hard is that i guess it is kind of hard because there's probably more people can name the number one draft pick in the nba draft last night that could tell you why uh, roe versus wade was overturned number two cares deeply we all care deeply and they're going to be a whole lot more people who are caring as the police stand in front of the supreme court right now i i, I couldn't get down there right but i'm I, I, at some point i worked my way down and then the third one in the wake of one and two, strategize. Strategize how to navigate power. 
you just laid that out beautifully, as you always do in this classroom and everywhere you are. But I mean, there it is. If y'all pay attention, care deeply and strategize, uh, we can take our chances. We'll be OK. So uh, today, the Supreme Court in a 63 decision that we already knew was going to happen because for weeks they, they, they leaked it. But then they were like, who leaked it? You leaked it. You leaked right. it because you, you knew that it was going to be a problem. You didn't want to surprise anybody. Uh, what'd you say, Smith? Five to four. Oh, sorry. All right. Five to four on Friday. I read it was six to three everywhere uh, to uphold mean? Mississippi law. Six to three to uphold Mississippi law. Five to four to overturn Roe v. Wade. What are the what are the differences in these two? The Mississippi upholding six to three and a five to four to overturn. Well, Roe you know, Wade. John Roberts um, is is well, he's past scared. He's the architect of this court, uh, but he's not the leader. The leader of the court is a man who has such a deep, deep self-hatred, uh, couched really in a belief in the fantasy called United States of America, that it almost appears as if it's pouring from his pores. And that would be Clarence Thomas from Pinpoint, Georgia. Uh, Clarence Thomas is, is potentially the leader of this court. Uh, his concurrence in the decision today, so Roberts is the one who would vacillate a little, but uh, Samuel Alitro, who is a Alito, who is a magnificently uh, a magnificent hater, to borrow the language of uh, uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries referring to Clarence Thomas. Uh, Alito's hatred is his 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 opinion was was just was just masterpiece. I got to give it to him. I mean, he's been chomping at the bit to do this. But that five, this between a five, four and a six, three in that case is Roberts just doesn't want to go down in history completely on the wrong side. But he did join in the uh, the decision to overturn Roe and the simplicity with which I wish I could find it quickly. The opinion here, because I've been reading it like everybody else. And I know we're going to talk about this at much more length. Uh, probably tomorrow in class. Oh, here it is. Held, the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey are overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. I love it. Sam, chef's kiss. You know the people and their elected representatives is some BS. This is why I said 1787. See, the, 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 I think, and without getting too deep into it, because again, we'll, we'll talk much more at length tomorrow and probably Monday night too as we're working through Octavia Butler nobody was supposed the idea of who is and isn't a citizen it didn't it didn't arrive with the white colonists in other words every every white person who set foot on this side of the ball during the period of colonialism was a subject of somebody's crown they were subject of the crown there's no citizens over here they're all colonies so when they move from subjects of the crown through various revolutions to citizens they've got to make up what it means to belong to this polity they call countries. In the case of the United States, the federal constitution excluded the ab aboriginal people and us, the people of African descent. And But it never settled the question of who else was a citizen until later. And what happened was the glitch in the project, that would be you and me and all the people who came before us, fought our way out of enslavement, uh, forced a crisis in the country called the Civil War, and then they passed three amendments. The 13th said, Enslavement is abolished, except if you commit a crime. And, and believe me, y'all, when you read Clarence Thomas's concurrence in uh, Dobbs versus uh, Jackson's Women's Health Organization, please understand that's the only thing standing between you and enslavement is the 13th Amendment. Now, of course, if you're a prisoner, you just SOL. Read Clarence Thomas's opinions and how he is hell on prisoners. But at any rate, the 14th Amendment then says that equal protection and due process of law is guaranteed to all citizens. That's about as close as you get to a citizenship piece. That's the piece that Sam Alito kicked in the teeth in this Dobbs case and Jackson Women's Health because there are two types of due processes we call substantive due process and procedural due process. Procedural due process means before I discriminate you, fire against you, I gotta give you a hearing. Substantive due process means at the hearing, we're gonna legitimately think about the what Alito and them said, there ain't no such thing as substantive due process. In other words, they kicked that in the teeth. What Alito said in this decision is, if it ain't written down, then we don't believe it. And it's not there. He says there is no right to privacy. And then Clarence Thomas chomping at the bit in the concurrence. And while we talking about no right to privacy, I'm going to get them contraceptives. 
I'm going to get you LBGT2 uh, cues, and I'm looking at the right to marriage. Meanwhile, the racists are sitting there saying, we can't put y'all back in slavery, but I damn sure if I can get enough votes in this state legislature, stop interracial marriage. Oh, loving, people say, you're crazy. And Alito, <laughs> Alito in his decision spends a lot of time saying, this is not that, this is not that, this is not that. And you can almost hear him telling Clarence, not yet, not yet. We got the numbers. Don't scare the people. Don't scare the people. But Clarence Thomas, read his concurrence. This man done said, I'm look, I'm thinking about Griswold versus Connecticut. I'm thinking about this. Well, what, is, what is Griswold? What is what is Griswold versus Connecticut? You're right to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Oh, contraception. contraception. <laughs> exactly. Because see, all of these rights, contraception, who you get to marry, who you all terminating the pregnancy, they come from something called privacy. And what they said is there ain't no word called privacy in this 1787 document or in any of the amendments and you inferred it. This is what our friend and colleague Angie Porter and all the legal scholars and lawyers would call the penumbra of rights. In other words, it's a shadow that is inferred by judges interpreting what is meant by the language in the Constitution. Well, what they did uh, today is say, yeah, shadow my ass, there ain't nothing written in here. So the right uh, uh, privacy? No, sir. I'm sorry. You don't have a right to privacy. And what Clarence Thomas said, well, shit, if you ain't got a right to privacy, then you ain't got a right to rubbers. You ain't got a right to birth control pills. You ain't got a right. No. Oh, oh, you mean, you mean I can't have them? No. What I mean is that if in this state they pass the law that you can't have them, the Constitution of the United States can't save you. I love it. I okay. Love it. All right. 866-801-8255. <laughs> Y'all have a chance to talk uh, with Dr. Gray Carr. He is here, um, yeah. Africana Studies scholar, as well as a legal scholar. He teaches that as well, the law. Let me ask you, okay, so Roe v. Wade, the, the Mississippi law is what? What is that? That is the, what, what's the difference between that and the overturning of Roe v. Wade? What's called a gestational age act, right? Provides that it, except in a medical emergency or in case of severe fetal abnormality, a person shall not intentionally or unknowingly perform or induce an abortion of an unborn human being if the probable gestational age of the unborn human being has been determined to be greater than 15 weeks. So they're going to put the cap on 15 weeks. <laughs> okay, so, so let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Texas, yes. Oklahoma, Louisiana, Kentucky, and South Dakota yes. have already passed laws banning abortions. That's exactly right. Even in case of incest, rape, mm -hmm. the health of the mother. So if you are a young person or an old person or a middle-aged person or any person with a uterus and you get pregnant in Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, Kentucky, and South Dakota, and I believe in Texas, if you go across to New York or someplace, or because th these are Oklahoma's a neighboring state, Louisiana is to the is a neighboring state. If you go to a state that allows abortion and you come back, I think you're still in violation, correct? Well, here's what it here's where it becomes wonderful. It just becomes so wonderful. I love it. Y'all got to understand. As, an, as, a, as a descendant of somebody who was dragged over here in chains, I have no investment in the current construct of something called the United States of America. It's a settler colony. You understand? And what I mean by that, turn to set the state, and this is where I say it's going to get very interesting. The same issue, at least close enough legally, the same issue now in terms of whether you travel somewhere, terminate a pregnancy, and come back, whether you violate a law that is held, upheld to be constitutional, it's the same issue as Dred Scott. This is why you hear them comparing Dred Scott. In other words, if they had us enslaved, Professor Hunter, in Texas, and uh, we escaped to say, I don't know, New York. In 1850, it had some kind of Fugitive Slave Act. They could drag you back to Texas because the Dred Scott case, 1857, said wherever you are in the United States, your status, if you are a person of African descent, follows you. Okay, now here's the question. If you live in Texas, get on a plane, get off in New York, terminate your pregnancy, come back, fly into Houston, Austin, Dallas, wherever, San Antonio, and they arrest you, is that constitutional? Because are they restricting your right to travel? You heard Joe Biden today talk about 15 minutes. He said, if y'all try to pass, this is a law. We got another constitutional issue. Just a question of federalism. Texas can't tell New York what to do unless you can. And if you can, you sound like Roger Taney and Dred Scott. Women, in other words, have no rights. Anywhere in the country that, 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 that these people are bound to respect. It is, it, it, now, it, people say, well, you're comparing uh, women to slaves. I'm sorry. Number one, don't you realize that most of the people who were held in slavery in this country were women? 
So black women, not women. This is the question. Is it, so you probably know with gender and race. Y'all stop trying to make intersectionality. There is no such thing as gender where there's solidarity between white women and black women. If there were, this wouldn't have been overturned because all them white women wouldn't have voted for Trump. But the point is this. <laughs> We're talking now about a fascinating question. The question you raise is the question. And I'll just say very quickly on this, very quickly, that as this project advanced across the continent and they began to continue to displace the Aboriginal people, the first crisis, which wasn't resolved in the Constitution, was the Civil War. What's the status of these Africans? Because in the South, they said, well, we don't, you know, we, at the end of the Civil War, the South is drugged back into the Union. But that only creates a temporary cessation of conflict. They're gonna use federalism. The idea that states got rights and you can't stop us from enslaving them, but we're gonna pass laws to discriminate against them. So it takes another hundred years and guess who has to come again and say, now nah, we're gonna rescue this thing. Not because we love it so much, but because if it falls, we're gonna be the ones that get hurt. Black people, that's called a civil rights movement. After the civil rights movement, these people regroup again. And they have finally got the number to get their swing punch back. This is a continuing boxing match. That's why I say it ain't 50 years. It's not 100 years. It goes back to the Constitution. And guess how they figured out a way to preserve their ideology? And by this, I mean straight white supremacists. It's called the Electoral College and the Representative Form. In other words, until you overwhelm us with numbers, and even if you do, We'll whisper in your ear and say, look, we know you Latino, but you Catholic too. And you know, you don't want to trans Unless you can overwhelm us, we can always have white minority rule in this country. And that's what we're seeing right now. So yeah, it's about, it's about half and half, Prof. About, about half the states, it's legal to terminate a pregnancy. And in the other ones, there are three, there's several categories. One is called pre-roll bans. You know what a pre, pre-roll ban? I was going to go through. Uh, okay, why don't you Alabama. do it? Yeah, lay, lay it out for us because people might okay. not understand just okay. what's about happening right now. Yes, ma'am, please, please. All right. So there were there were states like uh, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri, North Dakota, because South Dakota, the, the white, that that had bans in. Uh, and and they were waiting for Roe v. Wade to be overturned, which tells us that they knew it was going to happen, because why would you? state legislatively pass a ban on something that was still legal federally, Tennessee, Utah, Utah, Wisconsin, Wyoming, uh, and West Virginia. Now, I'm still not clear if, if I'm in Texas and I go to New York and I come back, can I be arrested? It's going to go into It's going to co go to court. It's going to go to court. They yeah, probably will arrest you, but then take it to the court. Well, or, or, or what they what they may do is suspend that law until it works its way through the courts, because in Texas, they're going to tell you you're going to jail. In New York, they're going to say, try us. In other words, this is exactly what happened before the Civil War. When nobody returned the Africans to enslavement, and so once you escaped to Pennsylvania, they was in Philly like, are them boys from Virginia up here? Let's get it on. And then, in other words, this is what we are on the verge of. It, Texas ain't even got that kind of muscle. So, yes, it's going to go through the courts, Prof. The only question is, are they going to allow it to go into effect or are they going to suspend it while it works through the courts? But that question you raise, there is no clear answer, except perhaps that they may have stocked this federal bench to the point where they can do that. And then you've, you've thrown the entire legal system into chaos. You've thrown the entire legal because you're dealing with federalism at that point. Yeah. So what's the recourse? Uh, we're going to talk about that. 866-801-8255. I want to get a couple of people in. They want to talk. So we're going to get some callers in. But I want I want to answer this question. What comes next? What's next? You say marriage between blacks. Like we're not different races. How are they going to bring Loving versus Virginia back into this? Is this about the preservation of whiteness? 866-801-8255. We're going to answer that question. Eunice in the DMV area wants to talk. Hi, Eunice. It's my turn. It's my turn. Wait. Are you whispering? Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Yes. Hey. Hi, this is absolutely, this is absolutely amazing. I love having the opportunity to like, you know, be able to speak. Um, and particularly for Dr. Carr, I want to know kind of like, as I'm a young, you know, a young Black student, I actually do go to Howard University myself. Um, okay. You know, how can I, you know, fight to... I'm going into law, I'm fighting to, you know, make a change because I don't want to feel like I can't do anything, you know? Yes. Oh, wow, Eunice. 
I feel the same way. Let me put it this way, because, you know, when I went to law school and after I clerked for the NBCP Legal Defense Fund, Sherilyn Eiffel was there at the time, young staff attorney. I realized that in many ways, the law ends up to be your honor, please. <laughs> so we could just throw all the law books out of it. It becomes a question of interpretation. And that's certainly what we see here with Roe. I think in terms of making a change, given those uh, three kind of principles we heard, Professor Hunter lay out, paying attention, caring deeply and strategize how to navigate power. I think the practical application of that for somebody who is going into the law is to not only continue to file lawsuits, but to organize at the same time. I think we have to uh, already begin to marshal our resources. So I, I hate to make this comparison, particularly as a person of African descent, but I'm gonna make it because I think it's terribly effective in this moment. There's gonna have to be an underground railroad for protecting women. And I know you said that probably, you know what I'm saying? If I wanna terminate a pregnancy, I need to get the hell out of Mississippi or Tennessee or some of these other places who have trigger lo laws. With, and you need to be able, finally, Eunice, to not only contribute to that work while you're studying, while you're pursuing the law, while you're making the legal arguments, but also help regular people demystify the law. Because we hold the law in such high regard because we've been propagandized to help people understand how to break it down. Because it, when people say it doesn't make sense, it usually doesn't make sense. But it's going to take those of us with legal training to help mm -hmm. people understand that, uh, Eunice. Thank you. And God, Eunice, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for yes. calling. Uh, let me just say this, not just the Underground Railroad. I was thinking today because, you know, I'm constantly planning, constantly planning. Yes. And I was really sad because, you know, in the 50s and 60s, and I got to interview people in the 40s who integrated Prudential. And I was talking to a woman who was part of my church who talked about, you know, getting out of college. They, t they the Urban League at the time had a group of women uh, in particular because women were less threatening and they weren't as scary. And they trained them for months how to be spat upon and cussed at and beaten to withstand, you know, all of the racism that they would experience to integrate, right? And yes. all over the country, they trained and then they had, they whittled it down to like the four that were the most ready to go integrate. But that was a, a concerted effort and a plan. The Freedom Rides, right? Oh, and, no. and the lunch counter, there was a whole machine behind having rows and rows of mostly students come in, sit at the counter, get their ass whooped, next row, arrest, row, get your ass whooped, go get arrested, next row, to break the back of something. But it was a strategy. And I was saying to myself today with lament that the apparatuses, uh, apparati, if it's Latin, that were in place then aren't in place now because those organizations have been bought and sold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people who run those organizations are now multimillionaires and very comfortable and very old in terms of passing the baton. Oh, They're yeah. run by people who are in their 50s and 60s and heading into their 70s. And we no longer have the 20 something year old students like Eunice who are both organizing like John Lewis and them, right? Uh, you know, the Pettus Bridge couldn't happen today. We go when it's, you know, George Floyd into them streets, but that's mm -hmm. not a strategy. That's anger in the moment. And that's, a you know, an utterance. It's not a plan. So I was saying to myself, not just the Underground Railroad, but I want to see Mississippi and Louisiana and Texas flooded with people coming in, set up an abortion truck, come get an abortion, arrest us, let's go, and let there be millions of people coming in because you can't arrest everybody. And if you do, you look crazy. And let that be the center. But I don't see who can organize something like that, Dr. Carr, because as much as we need to get people mm. out, poor people in to these places because we need numbers in places like South Dakota, North Dakota, they're ripe. A million black folk coming into South Dakota and the living is nice there. The air is clean, y'all. I'm <laughs> saying like well, that would change the political landscape dramatically. It, it would if we could organize it. I tell you though, this, and this is where, again, it, 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 as an intellectual proposition, it's intriguing. The sad thing about it is that we live in the real world, which means this has real world consequences. Imagine this, and, and, you know, how many people who support a woman's right to choose and the broader right to privacy, marry who you want, get kind of, how many of those people in their personal lives, their social lives and their cultural lives oppose that behavior? See, here's the problem. So if you say, well, I am supporting the right to privacy, the idea that I have the right to do with my body, I have the right to do with my family, I have the right to do with my partner, what I want. 
but I am against the be specific behavior. See, this is the this is the chat. There are two different things going on here. Mm -hmm. Part of the, the 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 success of the human freedom movement that we often refer to as the civil rights movement is it was clear that all of those young people and Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and Dorothy Cotton and Septon McClark and all them, Ella Baker, were on the side of the angels. There's a clear villain there. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But the minute we get involved in, when we commingle cultural issues, and finally, when the stakes are so high that the cultural issues are obscured by the real issue here. See, the real issue here, I don't think is the cultural wars or anything else. The real issue that we have to ask ourselves, as you know better than any of us, who benefits from this chaos? See, there's a reason why Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema can't come off, because they are wholly owned subsidiaries of finance capital. But the problem is the Ooh. capitalists can't make any uh, they can't make any decisions without political support. So they have to buy a legislature. So the real problem, the, the lead, what led up to today was the Supreme Court appointments, was Shelby Co uh, County versus Holder, which kind of curtailed, got elections close enough to steal. By the way, Merrick Garland, you got the guts to slap Andrew Gillum in chain in, in, in cuffs. You need to slap everybody else in cuffs. But that's why Benny Thompson, I believe, is stringing this thing out through July because he's putting what he's putting on trial is the Justice Department. So you making it so that they, they got to indict somebody because you get, anyway, back to the point. What we see then is we are faced with a dilemma that's going to require us to choose a side. And whereas in the civil rights movement, everybody was on the side of the angels, it was easy. What is happening now is that the capitalists, and by now all the capitalists in the world, I'm talking about the people who own enough stuff that they can buy senators, but the, the thing that turned them loose overwhelmingly, the thing that would put ads on the TV, so the people in Mississippi and Louisiana and Georgia, when you pull that truck up, people who look like us will be out there fighting you because they didn't seen the same ad on TV a million times. You see, that would be 2010. Johnny John, John John Roberts, who now has a runner train, train, he can't do nothing with. It. It's called Citizens United. United. Now, now there's no right to privacy in the Constitution, John John. But there is, under the First Amendment, a freedom of speech that you extended to corporations. That ain't in the Constitution either. Once you read the document, you realize y'all making it up. Most of what we call a law in this country is judge-made law. And when they decide to change something, they can either go to what the judges before them said, that would be called precedent, or they can go back to the original document depending on their politics. And they're going to be people who say, oh, it's not political. You better go read Amy Comey Barrett. Read her concurrence in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, the one day where they tell you now you can get your, your carry license in New York. Let me let me just very quickly quote what she says. This is her concurrence. Because in New York now, be afraid. Be very afraid about this. She says, to name just a few unsettled questions, how long after ratification may subsequent practice illuminate original public meaning? I'll tell you what the handmaid just asked right there. How long after the law is in place is it now beyond my capacity to go and play James Madison? <laughs> in other words, wait, so I'm going to re internet. Imagine this. You got a Negro from Pinpoint, Georgia, who, if he had his way, his own ass would have his shirt off picking cotton or in a rice field in South Carolina. Even, it's up. Imagine this what the framers meant. Amy Comey Barrett says, how long does a time have to elapse before I can go back and interpret what they say? Now, Stephen Breyer in dissent in the New York case said this, based on y'all logic, you went back in history, and Alito did it in the abortion case too, all these statutes against war. You went back in history and cherry picked history to make your story. You ignored, that's why if you read the, the New York State Rifle Association, Breyer's dissent, he starts with the number of people who have lost their lives to gun violence in this country in the last two years. The number of mass shootings just this year. He says, oh, so y'all want to talk about history? Can we talk about yesterday? Oh, y'all forget about yesterday. You jumped all the way back over to the damn British versus the colonists and forgot about the last six months. So anyway, I apologize. <laughs> so, so this is what- Because that is where they're going. Exactly. Come on, Prof. And again, Pay attention, you know, all, oh, slavery is never, they can never enslave people again until they do. But these things don't happen overnight. These are the birth pains that are talked about in the, those of you who read the, the Bible, birth pains. 
Yes. You know, you don't just have a baby. There's yes. contractions that come. Contractions, then there's a period of calm. And then, you know, after your water breaks, there's, there's more contractions. And then they come faster and faster and faster until the baby is born. And the baby in this case is, hmm, what do we call this baby? This baby is evil. This is like, oh, I know, Damien. Woo! That's his baby. That's dressed it all black like the omen. Shout out to oh, little Kim. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Except uh, I would say dressed in all white like the omen. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But but uh, I mean, what is that baby though? Is it evil? No, we, I, you know, I, if we we shouldn't have this conversation here. But I, <laughs> right, maybe we should. <laughs> so I mean, but Octavia Butler would say, you know, God is neither good nor bad. God mm-hmm. doesn't have a, you know, this is neither good nor bad. It is, it just is, right? And and for those of you who are impacted by it, you have to ask yourself the question: What are you going to do? You know what? Mm-hmm. What is it? What is your cost course of action? You know, no we all have a course of action. And, and, um, and let, let me, let's be very clear: I'm grateful that your mother didn't terminate the pregnancy that ended up in you. And I know you're grateful same. for that. The same for me, right? So we're not talking about abortion. Understand behind this conversation is privacy. Griswold versus Connecticut, which Thomas cites, is a decision that declared married couples have a right to contraception. Now, who would say they don't have a right? Somebody who Catholic looking in the Constitution saying they written Lawrence versus Texas 2003, case invalidated sodomy laws and making same-sex uh, activity legal across the country. And then, of course, we remember Overfell versus Hodges. That was just 2015. Gay couples have a right to marry. Clarence Thomas said all that comes to back to the right to privacy. And since there ain't no right to privacy in the Constitution, them the three I'm going after next. And Alito was in the majority saying, wait, 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 wait. Because he know that's where they going. Pay attention. <laughs> all right. Uh, we got callers. We got to go to a break. Uh, again, we're building... There, there's time and a place for everything. Yes. There's a time and a place for everything. The work that needs to be done, and this is not like reaction. This is not a reactionary move. This has to be, how do I want the world to look in a hundred years? What do I want the world to stand for? What do I want my children or grandchildren, great grandchildren to be in? And you start to build now. They said, I want a world where white men control everything. That's right. And they have put into place how to get that done. That's right. What's your equal and opposite reaction? Now's the time. It should have been the time. But if you are frustrated and angry, let's get busy. 866-801-8255. Come on home. Come on home to Nubia where we're getting some stuff done. 